Right, here we go. It's a quick romp through. I know it's the afternoon dead shift, as they call it, so stay with me here. Uh, off we go. I decided to call this talk, So What Did Aviation Ever Do For Us? And it goes back to a conversation I had with a doctor at a Human Factors conference about two years ago. And we were getting on perfectly well in the coffee break until I told her I was a pilot, at which point there was a sort of explosion. And she said two things that I remember vividly. Firstly, I am fed up being told what to do by aviation. And the second was, they don't understand medicine is a special case. And she was quite incontestant enough for me not to add any fuel to that, so I said quietly to myself, it just isn't, I'm sorry. It's no different from a coal mine, a steelworks, a hamburger joint, a DIY superstore, an airline. The lessons are the same, they're universal. But flying didn't learn these lessons through some intrinsic uh, cleverness. It, it learned them through tragedy, through catastrophe, through spreading the, the, the bodies of hundreds of thousands of innocent human beings on the mountains and lakes and runways. It's good stuff, isn't it, of the world. But although they were bitter lessons, they were lessons. They were learned, and everyone else gets them for free. So I do implore other uh, industries to at least consider that. This is my uh, professional background. I was originally a Navy helicopter pilot, a commando pilot, and then North Sea uh, commercial pilot. Subsequent to that, I got involved in the health service as a lay member of these various organizations, one of which in particular is the anesthetic department of the Homerton Hospital here, because it's the first uh, uh, anesthetic department that's been accredited through the Royal College of Anesthetists new accreditation scheme, and we're delighted that that's the case. So. Flying, is it dangerous? Is it hazardous? Well, we take a big tube and put hundreds of people in it and many tons of fuel. We hurt along a runway. We go up to 10 kilometers in the air. It's minus 60 degrees. Your time of useful consciousness is seconds. There's thunderstorms, there's volcanoes, there's downdrafts, there's fog, ice, snow, and aquaplaning. And yet, funnily enough, we don't actually kill people very often. <laughs> Now, for those of you who are statisticians, I don't want any trouble about this, okay? Because this is statistics. But if you look, first of all, on the left-hand side, and I hope you can see that all right, an extraordinary decline in the number of fatalities. This is American statistics over the last 60 years, from 140 to 100 million, which I thought didn't sound all that bad anyway, uh, down to almost nothing now. And the other one is deaths per billion kilometers. Now, I know it's a selected parameter, but the numbers are quite extraordinary. Now... There's probably some elderly gentleman here who 30 years ago had an old CD175 Honda and now can afford a 200 mile an hour superbike. Well, you down the bottom there. <laughs> it's actually safer in the space shuttle used in this parameter than, than it is on a motorbike, so do bear that in mind. <laughs> we have to have objectives. I'm not going to read them out, but this is what they are. So let's first of all look at checklists. Well, a shopping list is a checklist, of course. Uh, but they're used extensively. Aviation, even I didn't fly these, has gone from that uh, to this. But although that, this is an A380, the big uh, Airbus, um, most of the information is still there in similar form. You don't have a, a, an oil pressure gauge in your car anymore. You have an oil pressure warning light. And checklists have changed as well. <laughs> I'm willing to bet that that reads across to medicine. <laughs> And I did not say cardiac surgeons. <coughs> Apparently, I'm not supposed to say indiscreet things like that. Anyway, so this is a checklist of a Douglas DC-8. This is an old aircraft, about 60 years old. And the first thing that strikes you, it is extraordinarily complicated. This is one checklist for one part of the flight by one person, a flight engineer. And the first thing that strikes me about that is, surely you're going to miss something, especially if you're under pressure. And like, like you, we are under pressure all the time. So you're quite likely to miss that. The disadvantage is that there's only one person in it, and checklists work much better when there are two people for two reasons. First of all, that obviously you're less likely to forget things, but really importantly, checklists work at bringing the cohesion of a team together. Now, let's go to modern. This is an Airbus series, A320 series, happens to be at Madeira. And the top bit uh, is actually the entire checklist for the aircraft. So you take this aircraft around the world forever just using that little page. You might think on the bottom there that there's an on-ground emergency evacuation checklist. And you might think, well, why don't you just open the door and say, run away, we're all going to die. 
that would work, but it wouldn't work well because you need to control the situation. You need to make sure that air traffic involved, the engines are shut off, etc., etc. I won't go into it in detail, but it's another thing that a checklist can do. It can take a potentially unstable situation and stabilize it, and it works very well. And when you get people to do this for the first time, they always make a hash of it because they think urgency is haste, and it isn't, is it? Urgency is getting things rapidly done but under control. So. Here we are. You know this one? All using it? Any resistance to it? Is there a yes there? No? There has been some resistance to it. I think it's probably fair to say that if you look at the literature, at its absolutely worst, it's a neutral effect, but I think there's, there's lots of evidence to support that it does have some positive surgical outcomes. It matters a great deal how you introduce things. If I were to introduce to you and say, right, Monday morning, there's your checklist, get on with it. You're going to immediately be resistant to that. People don't like being told what to do. Actually, pilots don't mind. They're quite simple. You just wind them up and you tell them what to do. But you lot are not like that, are you? Yeah. I was at a meeting about two or three weeks ago, and the, the, sub, the M word came up, mandatory word came up. And the <coughs> consultant sitting next to me threw himself back in his chair and put his arms out like that and basically <laughs> said, don't tell us what to do. We don't like being told what to do. Well, aviation is a bit different. There are people like that in health. So it depends a great deal on how you introduce things. If you, if you take the team with you and say, look, this is the Benz, this is what we think, join with us in this, you will get people to join in with it. And that's true in general of anything, but it is certainly true of checklists, of which you will come up against them more and more. So, would you accept that? Okay. <coughs> right. SOP, standard operating procedures, one of the complete pillars of safety in aviation. Absolutely critical. That's a definition I would like to think that in addition to uniformity, you might want a high standard. So if anyone goes into any of our hospitals, they're entitled to expect, shall we say, not just a uniformity, but a certain standard that we would regard as a minimum. But I've put that as a subject that don't surprise me. And basically, because if I go off flying, go somewhere and come back again. Whatever happens in that flight, I, I don't want the person next to me to do anything, and that, that includes the cabin structure as well, to do something that I didn't expect them to do, regardless of the situation. And that includes any emergency situation. They won't be automatons, but they will do things in a manner which I have come to expect, and so nothing terribly unexpected will happen. I'll come to this in a minute, but just, just to say, Anything that's changed in a flight deck is done by transaction. You never do anything without telling the other person, however minor that's got to be. But we deal with the, with the general situation which I'll come to in our SOPs. Now, I just want to mention language because it is actually quite dangerous stuff. One of the reasons why it's dangerous is that we come from such different backgrounds. Now, it, flying is, of course, an, um, an international multicultural business, but we also live in, in multicultural societies. I, for example, I'm a foreigner. I'm from Scotland. <laughs> and three months ago, I thought I was going to go either get a visa or go home. And if Nicola Sturgeon has our way, that may yet be the case. So I use language in a slightly different way, I realized when I first got into flying. And here's a very minor example. I came onto a new airline as a direct entry captain. I hadn't flown the Airbus before. And we were going into a place called Proveza in Greece. So we were going to fly down to the airfield, do a loop, and come back in again. Now I looked at it. The wind was calm, and there was no traffic. So I said to the first officer, David, we're 110 miles out here. I think there's enough distance for us to go straight down and land on 06 and, and save all that time and fuel. And he said, yep, that sounds okay. So I said, shall we do it? And I thought that was a sort of executive command. And I waited for him to get descent clearance, and nothing happened. So after an uncomfortable sound, I said, is there something wrong? And I said, he said, yes, are we going down? And I said, yeah, I just said we're going down. And he said, no. He said, shall we do it? And I had no idea what that meant. So, very minor thing, but I thought. Here's another one. You're going, and so let me just keep this to fly, but you can read across them. You're going to an island, let's say Mykonos, and the, 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 the procedures here, here, out here, out here, out here. And you say to the, someone in the other seat, I think today I'm going to go around the other side of the mountain and come down land on a left base for 06. Are you happy with that? Well, you might get yes, and that's fine. You might get no, and that's even better, because that means that that person has the confidence 
to say to you, I'm not happy with what you're doing. I may not be happy if that goes wrong. But the difficult answer is something like, um, yeah, I suppose so. <laughs> now, unfortunately, an assertive leader, captain, whatever it is, may well turn that into with a bit of pressure. Good, that's, you're not, you're, you're, you're probably, it'd be fine, won't you? You're happy. Uh, yes, all right then. But that yes really meant no, didn't it? It meant I am not happy, and you have to stop at that point and give that person the option and say, no, I'm not happy. You can either reassure them with further breathing, or you can say, okay, we won't, we'll stick with what you want to do, and you'll see the little shoulders coming down like that because they were not happy. Another and last example, I was going into a, um, an oar rig called a jack-up rig in the North Sea, and it, it's quite um, cantilever legs all over the place, although the, the regulations about the flight deck are, are rigid, and it, was, it, was, it conformed to those regulations. But as we came over the deck and I'm flying, the chap in the left-hand seat looks out the window and says, nothing to port, nothing to the left. Does anyone in here interpret that any other way then it's clear on the left-hand side, there is nothing to port. Because he meant exactly the opposite. He meant, whatever you do, don't go this way. Now, I might have gone, nothing to port. Oh, and I said, nothing to port. Yes, David, I heard you. Well, no, really, there's nothing to port. And it came from the fact that his previous existence, we had both been uh, Navy pilots, but he had been a um, merchant seaman. So on the, the, the uh, bridge of his ship, if there were shallow water ob obstructions or something, he would say to the helmsman, nothing to port, which means whatever you do, do not turn the wheel this way. As it happened, we didn't die. Although I suppose that depends on your existentialist view on life. <coughs> right, so here we go. This explosion in a needle factory is, in fact, the airways chart for the London area. And we are in the middle there in London City. But I can simplify it. And this is now a standard departure out of Gatwick going up to the east of Clacton. It has constraints vertically and horizontally. And we're going to fly that. Now, air traffic control says to us something like top jet 123, turn right heading 060 degrees, climb flight level 170, contact London 134.85. Well, the first thing that's wrong with that, three instructions is bad. If you give people three, they will remember the first one easily. They will remember the second one probably. They may not remember the third one. And unfortunately, they may either do nothing or what they think. And also it goes down to this, what the personalities are like, what your dynamics in your team, as whether they have the confidence to go back to you and say, you know what, boss, I've forgotten that third one. If your team dynamics are right, they won't be afraid to say so. But anyway, the first one was turn right heading 060. The paneling pilot will take the aircraft, turn the heading to 060 and pull it, and the aircraft will turn. The response in SOP standard is, is check. But check doesn't mean, oh yeah, yeah, I see that. What it means is, I see you've selected heading 060, I see you've pulled it, I see the, the aircraft turning to 060, and I agree that that is our air traffic and tron clearance. That's all implicit in that word, and that's what we are taught that it means. The next one said, climb to flight level 170. So again, you would select the altitude selector, pull it, select 170, and the aircraft would climb. You then say, 170 blue. I'm not going to go through the whole flight, we're stopping in a minute. <clears throat> The 170, he says 170 blue. So the response is check. And again, that check means I see you've selected flight level 170. I see you've pulled it. I see the aircraft is climbing. I agree it's air traffic control clearance. And it's blue because the enunciate is indicating that we are climbing unrestricted to flight level 170. So that's the way we would conduct the whole flight. And then the other thing I want to say is what would happen if the SOP didn't work. So all aircraft, all airlines have a flight, a check, a thousand feet to go to the next level. So a thousand feet to go, the handling part will say, one to go. And the response is, one to go. If he or she doesn't say that, in a slightly more assertive voice, the other part will say, one to go. And that usually gets, oh, sorry, one to go. But if there's no response to that, there'll be one more check. And that will be really assertive. One to go, and if they don't get an immediate response to that, you take the control of the aircraft away. Because you have to cover the incapacitation. And incapacitation is not not always conveniently twitching and heaving and firming and turning blue. It can be very subtle, I suppose something like a TIA maybe, but it could also be a psychological incapacitation. So we, 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 that's also the case throughout the entire flight. Anyway, let's go on and talk about death. 
The number in the bottom left corner is the number of people that cut. You don't mind this, do you? But this is things you'll learn from. Flying Tiger 66 is going to Kuala Lumpur, and they get a descent clearance. And descent clearance is that. Descend two, four, zero, zero feet. Is that unambiguous? Seem fairly straightforward? I cannot imagine anyone in their senses accepting that it descends, that the controller really wants you to descend to 400 feet. But that's what they decided had happened. <coughs> non standard language, the language should have been Tiger 666, descend altitude 2,400 feet. I'm still in response. Didn't work out for them, as you can see. They went into the ground, and in fact, not only was that non standard, but the ground proximity warning system is saying, pull up, pull up six times, and they ignored it, and this little voice at the end says, 100 feet, no, <coughs> well, that's it. Non-standard, air traffic control, the language of air traffic control worldwide has to be the same. This is, uh, yes, okay. <laughs> I hope you don't mind this, but actually it's jolly interesting, I think. Bergen Air 301 is a Turkish airline, and they're flying from uh, Puerto Plata, which is in the Dominican Republic, and they're going to uh, Frankfurt with German tourists. Don't worry about this. The only thing we're interested in is V1. V1, you've probably heard all the time, it's very simple. All it means is the speed up to which, if you have an engine failure, you will be able to stay on the runway. You won't go off the end. After V1, you're going too fast. You will go off the end, so you have to carry on. But that's fine. Performance has worked out for this. You take off and go off and come back again or go somewhere else. But in order to confirm that you're getting into the high-speed regime, most airlines have a call around about 80 knots, 100 knots. And the idea is I say to you, 80 knots, 100 knots. And, uh, and the idea is that that's a check, and we just our final check before we go into this high-speed regime. Well, this is what they did. So the first officer says 80 knots, and the captain says checked. But two seconds later, he's changed his mind. My airspeed indicator is not working. So what's a good idea? Absolutely. This has happened to me. <coughs> the, the captain would take control and stop the aircraft. And from 80 knots, nothing. It's half the speed you'd be landing at. It's not a big deal. They didn't do that. So let's go on a bit. It's not going so well now. What you've got here is on the captain's side, the airspeed getting faster and faster and faster. The nose is coming up to control that speed. The autopilot clicks out. But on the first officer's side, the speed's getting lower and lower and lower and lower. Just so towards the stall, and his is right. How do they work it out? How do they put that right? This is over the sea at night. There's no real horizon. Well, the fact is they don't. And this, oh, what's happening thing, we will come back to. So there's your 189. Scores going up here. Let's just quickly go on. One of the reasons why that happens, that thing on the bottom left is called the pitot tube. And basically, the total air pressure goes in there, and by comparing it to the static pressure, just like your barometer pressure, you get a measure of speed. In this case, they think it was blocked. Extraordinarily, they even think it was the insect. I don't mean that particular one. <laughs> it, it might have been one of his mates, but it was one of his mates. <laughs> And they decided that just that in itself had brought down this aircraft. I'll come back to what that's about in a minute. So now we've got a really disturbing accident, a recent one, Air France 447, recently. So they're going from Rio to Paris. And because it's a long way, they've got crew of three, captain and two first officers. They're going to go through the intertropical convergence zone, which is an area of instability, thunderstorms, and so on. And fairly extraordinary, the captain decides to go to bed at that point and leaves it to the two first officers. They've got these pitot tubes as well. They've got one for the captain, one for the first officer, and one for the third set of flight instruments. But they go into very severe icing. And although these pitot heaters are heated, they become overwhelmed and things start to go a bit pear-shaped. The first thing that happens is the auto -fly autopilot says the autopilots come off. Bleep, it makes a noise, bleep, bleep, and it comes off. It says, I'm not getting valid information here. You have to do it yourself. Next one is auto flight, auto thrust off. Is this too detailed, by the way? Is this is all right? Yeah. Auto flight, auto thrust off. And that means the auto thrust, which controls the engines, is also saying, I've got an information here. But it won't shut down the engines. It will just leave them exactly where they were. 
And the third one, this is a fly-by-wire aircraft, it's saying, alternate law, you have got some protections that I, couldn't, I can't give you anymore because I don't have valid airspeed data. Now, does anyone remember Timmy Mallet from children's programs? If Timmy Mallet could come into that flight deck with a hammer and give Timmy Mallet's mallet on both those first officers, or one of you lot chloroformed them for a few minutes, this probably would never have happened. But they started to miss through some catastrophic misunderstanding of how the aircraft flies or what happened, and they got into the same thing. And here it is again. What's happening? Situation awareness is completely gone. Now, the reason why I'm going on about this 228 people this time is that each of these things could have been put right by standard operating procedures. And here's one that would have got them out of it. It's part of Airbus training. I spend many hours talking to pilots about how to deal with unreliable speeds. It's not difficult. We do it in the simulator. We take the aircraft at flight level 350, as per 35,000 feet, doing 500 miles an hour, we make a mess of all the speeds, and we make them fly the aircraft all the way down to land at 150 miles an hour on a runway. We never overspeed the run speed, the gears coming down, the flaps coming down, everything works. And we do it because we have standard operating procedures. So I say again, I don't think so. Now, are you very subject to SOPs? Do you have them? Do you believe in them? Harish? Is that a yes or a... Okay. I'm rushing on here, I know. We could spend weeks talking about human factors. To us human, I think that was Johnson Swift. And basically what that little uh, definition says, I think essentially if it can go wrong, it will go wrong. We used to call that Murphy's Law. Now, I know everyone's sick of their slices of Swiss cheese. <laughs> We're constantly devouring them and you can go off them. <coughs> But they do work as a model. They are a terrific model. And as you know perfectly well, once this, if any of the slice can be moved out of line, you don't have the nasty bit at the end. And I often used to wonder when I go to work, if, if let's say you had 100 clicks or 100 slices or 100 combinations, if you had 99, you'd go home thinking you had a normal day. Because the last slice would have kept you safe. And these things are sitting behind us. They're stalking us all the time, you, me, all of us, whether in our cars, in our hospitals, wherever. And I used to wonder, well, was today a three-day, a 46-day, a 97-day? There is no way that I know, but I know they're out there, like Freddy Krueger, waiting to get me. So I have to watch out for Freddy. We've got a couple more accidents, I'm afraid, but this is a seminal accident in aviation. So these guys are going into Miami, um, and as they start their descent, they should have three greens. You've probably heard the expression to show that the main gear and the nose gear is locked down, right? What they get is this. One light is out. Now, that could be two things. It could mean that the nose wheel is locked up. It's not down. It's not safe. If it was in transit, the light would be red. But it could also mean that the bulb has failed. So, they go off at, and hold at 2,000 feet, perfectly safe, sensibly with the autopilot in, and there's three of them get completely into this bulb. As one of them goes down, to, and they called it the hell hole, to go down and see whether he could see the gear, but he couldn't. The gear was down, the gear was locked. And they, well, gee, you should take it out that way. Maybe, uh, no, I don't think it goes that way. And, and while this is going on, the autopilot, quiet, not quietly, the autopilot clicks off. And it does make a noise, and it does warn you. But they don't notice it. Continuing to look in this bulb, they drift down, and eventually, here we go again. We're still at 2,000 feet, right? Hey, what's happening here? Situation awareness gone. 101 people killed. There were some survivors. This is a really important accident in aviation history <coughs> because it led to this mantra of aviate, navigate, and communicate. And I was trying to think of it, how it relate to medicine. Aviate means keep the aircraft flying. I don't know if this is a valid description, but supposing you're doing an operation and something goes wrong, like, I don't know, a major hemorrhage. Now, presumably, you might even just do that and stop the hemorrhage, because what you have to do is keep this human being flying. You can deal with the appendix or whatever it was in a minute. So the first objective is to make sure that this, the, the, the human being is going to continue to fly. You then decide how you can do it, and then you communicate to those around you. So it's the, sort of the same thing for you. I didn't get much response from the thing at the bottom, I see. <clears throat> <coughs> and now we come to the daddy, 
I don't know how we're doing for time, if somebody could tell me. Are we all right, Harris? Are we all right? Worst accident in aviation history. It has, and again, a very interesting history. So, when you go on your holidays, you go to Tenerife South, the blue one at the bottom. This day, there's a bomb at Tenerife South. And I don't mean a bomb warning, there actually was a bomb. So the aircraft perfectly safely divert up to Tenerife North, another active airport, which only has one runway and one major taxiway. And this is there. Now, the KLM aircraft, because they're big, they can't go along the taxiway, right? So the KLM aircraft is going to go down, taxi down to the end, and he's going to wait at the end there. The Pan Am is going to come after him and taxi along the runway, and they're going to come off at three or four and wait on the end here. That's the idea. The complications, well, right, so it's foggy. Now, why that's important is the air traffic controller can't see the aircraft, and the aircraft can't see each other. They can't use the taxiway because they're too big, so they've got to go down the runway, and they're on the runway at the same time, 2747s. There's some confusion on the radio, there's some non-standard, here we go, language, and the fuel load on the KLM is quite an interesting one because the captain of the KLM aircraft said that he'd like to refuel at Tenerife North to save him refueling at Tenerife South because everybody would want the fuel bars at the same time. And that was a very sensible decision. However, it may have contributed to the disaster because they were much heavier and may not have got off the airport so uh, they are uh, a runway so easily. And then we've got these team dynamics which come to haunt us all. APP is the controller, P is a Pan American. Now, OK, we'll report one clear and thank you is not their traffic control language. But here's the big, big, big dangerous ones. Oops. KLM3 is a flight engineer, and he says, is he not clear then? And that's a bit like me saying earlier, are you happy about this? Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Is he not clear then? It's a big, big red warning light. The captain says, what do you say? And he says it again. Is he not clear, that Pan American? Now, for heaven's sake, you have to stop. If I, on occasions, if I'd gone on, onto a runway and not sure whether I'd, I'd got takeoff clearance, I'd say to the first officer, do we have takeoff clearance? If he says, no, I accept that. If he says, yes, I don't. And say, ask Tower because they won't mind doing it twice. So emphatically, an assertive, charismatic senior captain, dangerous figure, no, you know what I mean, because of the dynamics, says emphatically, yes, he's clear. He might just have heard that. But even that's not the case because they never got takeoff clearance and off they went. I know this is miserable stuff, but it's really important. And so we get to this, for which I apologize. Oops. The worst accident in aviation history, 583 people killed and let's hope to God it never happens again. But we did learn a great deal from it. It is the worst, it's the pits, but it was a long time ago. I only mention this briefly, it's an accident about running out of fuel, but I only mention it because we're talking about human factors, and three 31 human factors were identified. And one of the things interesting, which vaguely comes back to someone said earlier, is how many human people were involved in here. The captain, the first officer, the flight engineer, the senior flight attendant, director of maintenance back in Bogota, the director of operations, right down to the Federal Aviation Authority management, who are presumably sitting in their offices in Washington. And they've all got their cheese sliced, and they're all moving them around. So they're all stalking each other here. And now I want to, yes, it's important, rushing on. I find the health service, frankly, ladies and gentlemen, bewildering about incident reporting. I really don't understand how it works. In aviation, it's completely open, by, by necessity, not by, as I say, not by cleverness. So if somebody files a safety report, it goes to the flight safety officer and he or she have an unimpeded line to the director of flight operations. I don't know how you do it. I don't know whether it keeps in house. There seems to be no central focus for information. <coughs> if something happened in a hospital in Newcastle, let's say, where there was a risk or something of patient harm, if I was in a hospital in Cornwall, I want to know about that. This is going to add to my safety culture. Everything needs to be reported. We have incident reports, however minor they are, they are, they are distributed within the company, they distribute to the whole industry if they want to see it, and I've learned a great deal about flying from sitting on my backside in the crew room reading other people's experiences. <laughs> Civil aviation, as it happens, has a mandatory reporting scheme, and I'm not too concerned about you reading it, but the point at the bottom is it's disseminated. Everybody sees it. I think you're doing quite well considering the time of day, by the way. I'm nearly finished. 
The Americans have an anonymous system. Do, do any of your hospitals or do anyone have an anonymous reporting system? <coughs> you don't. Does anyone? There, there are some around. There, you do. Well, the nuclear industry does, yes. Yeah. They're very important because people can report things that they're uncomfortable with. They are saying a million people have reported and they've never disclosed their details. We have the same. It's called CHIRP. It's much the same thing. If you have areas of concern, you can put it in and something will be done about it. How do you feel about that? Nearly finished. Is that fair? Now, is that partly because of the nature of keeping things hidden? In other words, we don't tell other people what's happened in our hospital because we don't want people to know. Is it because you don't know what's happening in other places? Would you be informed? You would be informed by other people's incident reports, however minor. Here's the aviation equivalent. Can you read it or what? That's the culture that I worked in. I despair of it sometimes. There is a mountain to climb. But I'll talk about this in a minute, but in case I forget, to, to be fair, and some of the conversations we've had today and some of the questions and answers we have do actually recognize that we know what the problems are and we also know the solutions. How you bring it about in such a fragmented uh, uh, service, I really don't know. So let's talk briefly about fatigue, because I see one or two of you are getting a bit tired. I'm not offended by your yawning. <laughs> I only want to say about fatigue, it's not like being tired. Those of you who came through before the European Time Works Directive and all that probably very well know what fatigue is like. But the future of the health service does look as if, doesn't it, it's going to be a seven-day, 24-hour elective service. It's certainly a seven-day service. And if that's the case, that's your future. And if you're Monday to Friday, Saturday in the golf course, I mean no disrespect, that's all going to change. But what really changes it is when your sleeping patterns change. They are the really dangerous things. Working hard makes you tired. But if you go to bed and wake up in normal diurnal circle, circle of flight, it's okay. Fatigue is drained not necessarily sleepy. You could take a fatigued person and make them lie down and have a sleep and they won't be able to sleep. And the really dangerous thing about it is that if a dangerous situation is building up, you will not see it coming. And when it suddenly falls in front of you, you will not have the resources to deal with it. How you get out of it, I don't know. There are many aspects you've got to try and get your sleep as much under control as possible. You try and get your nutrition balanced in such a way that you're reasonably, you know, you don't have any hypoglycemic cycles. You have to be careful about the use or abuse of alcohol or the use or abuse of sleep-inducing drugs. They're all part of it. It is very difficult to deal with. It is insidious. It is dangerous. Well, briefly, I had a friend who was landing on a gas rig many years ago. He said it was a perfectly nice day, and I suddenly turned to the other pilot and said, I feel completely detached. Will you take over controls? Now, that could have been something else, but I think also that's a classic fatigue thing. But be aware that it's not just because you're sleepy. I offer that to you. It comes from America. We have a lot to offer, but you sort of need to want to take it. And that is quite enough for me. <laughs> <laughs>